Hey, man, I need a fix. I need a fix bad. So you need a fix, huh? Oh, God, man, I need a bad. Hook me up. I got your fix. I got your fix right here. All right, Jeep Junkies, we know you're jonesing for a midweek fix, so we're going to hook you up with a little midweek XJ Talk Show to tide you over. Tonight we've got Mark with Detours USA, and he's uh, agreed to do an interview with us. Mark, thanks for being on the show. Hey, Tony, it's my pleasure. Why don't we start with uh, some of your uh, personal background information, let people know who you are and, you know, how you got to where you are today. It all pretty much started, you know, with the old uh, metal shop in high school, and then from there went into the uh, Air Force, and I uh, uh, actually enlisted as a metal fabricating specialist. So uh, I waited about seven months for my career to came come up, and uh, ended up going to school uh, for that in the Air Force, and did my time there, and then worked my way through after the fact, and eventually... Uh, started doing my own thing. How long were you in the Air Force doing the, the metal fabrication? Uh, I had enlisted, I was 18, got out at uh, 20, a little over 22, I believe. That had to have been rough. I know I wasn't very mature at 18. I don't know how well I would have taken orders, uh, even if I was doing something I liked. Um, probably, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Let me just say that. And, uh, you know, sometimes you, you could use a little discipline. So, I mean, if I was the guy going to college, I would have been buying the keg every Tuesday night and majoring in student <laughs> loans. Gotcha. Yeah, I played a lot of so, pinball in, uh, in, in college, so, <clears throat> yeah. unfortunately. So, um, from, well, I guess, actually, when was the first time you got interested in off-road stuff? Is that something that was before or after the, the interest in metal fabricating? Uh, well, after, and, uh, it was after my divorce, actually. <laughs> I was into, uh, the polished muscle cars and, uh, and Corvettes, and I've had a lot, a lot, a lot of different vehicles, and, uh, they always sat in the garage after they were finished and just sat there and. I guess a big change in your life, you, you uh, take on different challenges, so it's, instead of polish them, I decided I wanted to go dent them up. So, you mean, but you went out and drove them fast, right? Uh, lightly. They were more, you'd build one to create something of more value to build the next one and just continue increasing value and your purse strings. Well, that's, in, that's interesting because that's exactly what my dad told me to do whenever I got my first vehicle was, you know, fix it up, sell it, and get you a better one and so on and so forth. I never did do that, but that was uh, exactly what, what he had recommended to me. Yeah, that's interesting because yep. I was going to say uh, the muscle car thing, I was I was doing that myself. I had a uh, 72 Nova with, a, uh, pictures. with a 327 and yep. uh, L60s with traction bars, and it was just a, a blast, but... I, I certainly didn't want to dent it, but boy, I just drove the hell out of the thing. And uh, well, I, actually, I broke the main on the three twenty seven driving the hell out of the thing. Yeah, um, pretty hard. And on. that's a whole different crowd. You know, you don't have the same camaraderie. There's there's small, but it's a very small circle you travel in, and you know, you're doing the car shows on Sundays, wasting your whole day in a parking lot. Kind of, uh, kind of gets old after a while. Yeah, I guess so, because uh, like I was talking to somebody else uh, on another show, uh, the, the whole muscle car thing is you go out, it's a competition. You go out and you race right. somebody, and it's very, right. very a very aggressive thing, whereas the off-road scene is more of a partnership, and hey, look what I can do, and oh, I got stuck, and here, let me help you out. Here's a part, here's an axle, so on and so forth. So Exactly. There's you a, get the camaraderie. Yeah, there's a lot of nice things about <laughs> off-roading. I mean, it's not always the case. People are people, but... Uh, for the majority of the time, I think that it's exactly that way. At least that's what I've seen. It's uh, it's, yeah. a, it's very nice. It's more, much more friendly. I think you'll continue to see that. So when did you, uh, w how did you get started fabricating uh, uh, parts for Jeeps? Or, or was that your first things, uh, first automobiles? Um, 
Was it off road yeah. stuff or was it? Uh, I guess the muscle cars you were fabricating, but I mean, as far as metal work goes, as far as the the muscle cars and the customs, it was uh, I was chopping, which is when you lower your roof. Mm-hmm. I was Frenching, which is when you countersink lighting into the side of the body of the vehicle and all that kind of shave door handles, all that kind of stuff. Um, off road stuff. Early on, I had a Bronco too, but I really wasn't. It was just kind of a pacifier way back when. And then I, when I really started getting in the off road, I bought a '71 Bronco. And probably about four days after that purchase, I realized it was probably just too nice to take out wheeling. Mm-hmm. So I flipped that one. As far as you know, I did some things to it and got. 4000 more out of it than I paid for it. Wow, that's sweet. So I flipped that, and then I uh, got into a YJ, and then, you know, we started, I just, you get a Jeep, and you start falling in with people. And uh, the fabricating was always there, but it was never applied towards Jeeps prior. And that was, had to be at least, geez, 11 years ago, 10 years ago, I don't even know. And so, then it just kept snowballing. So really, it's been relatively relatively recently that you've you've done the fabrication on Jeeps. Relatively, yeah. Um, I mean, I know 10 years seems like a long time, but I actually <clears> thought <throat> you'd been doing it a lot longer. The, the quality of the, the workmanship that I see looks like something that you've been doing for, I mean, I know you're not this old, but it looks like you've been doing it for 30 years. Uh, let me do some quick math. It won't be long. <laughs> no. Um, well, it may be. Maybe the quality it's... comes from doing architectural steel for, uh, I can't even tell you how long I did that. 11 years, probably 11. I had structural and architectural steel. I ran a shop in uh, Brantford, Connecticut. Um, I was actually a shop foreman. And... Uh, yeah, that's where all the polishing comes from is the architectural side of things because architects can be pretty nutty. Oh, I'm sure. They, so they, you kind of get in that habit. They design it on paper or on computer, and it's perfect. And if they see it, yeah. the, they see it in the real world, you know, they don't understand. They don't care. They want it perfect, I would exactly. imagine. And if it's not perfect, you're not working for them again. So it's, uh, you know, it's just a time-consuming thing, and you do it. You just learn to do it. Well, uh, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I'm, I'm not a welder, but whenever I received your um, uh, bumper, rear bumper, the... Um, slimline bumper. Slimline, that's what I was trying to say. Yeah, I got your the, the slimline, slimline bumper, and I was just amazed, at, even on the inside where nobody could see. Just beautiful welds. Uh, yeah. And again, I don't know anything about welding, but I, I know what looks good to me. And well, thank you. That, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to try to talk you into making that front bumper, which which wasn't an easy process, but you finally gave in. Yeah, it was fun. Beautiful. What it is, it's hard to schedule that type of custom handmade work around a regular schedule. And if you if you mess it up, you got to start over. So Yeah, well it turned out well, uh everybody, everybody always asks me about the bumper or always says The bumper is beautiful. And and I will tell them, yeah, the same guy that made this made the rear bumper. Then we'll go around the back and look at it. But they always notice that front bumper. It's a a beautiful thing. I've had a few emails on it. (laughs) Well, I certainly certainly talk about it a lot. So that's uh, That's cool. Lots of publicity on it. So you mentioned Connecticut. Is that where you're originally from? Yeah, born and raised in Connecticut, a little cow town. Um... 18 miles northeast of Hartford, which is the capital. But, yeah, the cows outnumbered the, the people and so on and so forth. Used to walk to school all the time, every day. So. It doesn't sound like a bad life. I mean, I'm sure it's nice to be, it would be nice to be in a different environment since that's what you're used to, but um, the... Uh, Times were different back then. Yeah, the country life is uh, can be a very nice one. Uh, of course, except when you're a young man and looking for a, a girl to go out with. I never had any problems there. (laughs) 
So, uh, so you were in Connecticut until you went into the Air Force, and then um, when you got out of the Air Force, you were back in Connecticut up until what, just a couple of years ago, right? Yeah, um, Connecticut, then the Air Force. I spent a year down in uh, Texas, and then I spent just about four years uh, up in northern Maine, up near Caribou, and uh, that was pretty cool. Once you learned how to enjoy winter. It's pretty cool up there. And then came back to Connecticut and did my thing for years. And, you know, then the little one came along and we were, we saw the, the bubble being bursted. Didn't know how bad it was going to be, but we saw it. And uh, we scouted this area here in Kentucky a year in advance and uh, decided to make the move out here back out to the country. Well, from the pictures that I've seen, uh, it's a very beautiful country that you're living in. And uh, what a great place to to raise a small child. It, it is. It's it's got its challenges sometimes. You know, I'm busy. I'm busy ten hours a day, seven days a week. If I want to be, and if I'm not working, I'm. I confess, I'm mentally working. But uh, you know, it can be tough when uh, the wife doesn't have a whole bunch to do, and uh, you know, Junior's looking for for something to do himself. So, but it's, it's, I, I hope it all works out. Well, the, um, I know that's where my bumper was born. My, uh, the that's front right. bumper. So, um, so, uh, you're in Kentucky now and, uh, you're still in business. You actually have a shop that's just right there uh, by the house. So, yeah, we want to put everything on the same property. That way I wasn't really an absentee dad. Well, well, Owen, our son, is uh, in his little years. You know, later he won't want to hang around with Dad, but we'll see. Oh, I suspect he'll be out there wanting to help you. Um, I mean, oh, actually half of being this place a, is a playground right now. But I mean, actually being a help, uh, I bet you he'll be out there working the uh, working the equipment before long. Another five years uh, or so. He can he can actually work the iron worker because it's pedal control. I don't let him hold the steel, but he will apply the pressure to the pedal and punch the steel and uh yeah he likes goofing around with the big saw but we all know what kind of damage that can do so Mm -hmm. well that's i mean that's wonderful stuff Uh, i mean that's things like that have always interested me and uh, my grandfather actually had a uh, a welding shop for 47 years i think um in a little town just uh just west of where i am now and uh it was just a blast when i would go over there and spend time uh there in his shop and uh he did a lot of welding, a lot of uh, a lot of cutting of metal, and uh, I would get to take the metal and go put it in the water to cool it off. <laughs> there you go. Yep. So My was, grandfather was actually a, a, a shop school teacher, a metal shop school teacher. Well, that's interesting. I actually have his old drill press sitting over there on the corner that I use every day. Do you think that affected your decision to become <laughs> a, a metal fabricator at all? Uh, might have been in the blood. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I, you know, not directly, I don't think. Yeah. Well, I thought maybe you'd no. hung out and, you know, found it interesting. No, I know my dad did some uh, metal work when he was in the Army, but uh, nothing really structural or anything like that. It was more ornate. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when was the first time you started uh, working on uh, Jeep Cherokees or fabricating things for, for Cherokees? Jeeps. Well, I started with YJs. Our, my oldest project, products are uh, the incline equalizer for the old 258 with the Weber carburetor swap. I knew there had to be a way of getting that carburetor to perform off camber, and uh, I actually found it. And then from there, drop kicks. That's probably the second oldest uh, product. Uh, it is the second oldest product, and that's started with a YJ and then went on to TJs. I offer them for CJs for a while, but the CJ frames are just too, too uh, let's just say they've been around too long. Yeah. So the, I'm and sorry, then, the drop uh, kicks or, or what? Are those sliders or what? Drop kicks are a slider type of item for uh, the Wrangler bunch, um, gotcha. but more or less designed to kick you off an obstacle. Um, my original wheeling experience was in the northeast where you have a lot of trees and a lot of rocks so the trails can become tight 
And as we all know, our uh, rear ends don't always want to follow the front ends. Mm -hmm. So they're basically designed to push the vehicle off the obstacle. And they work well. So that was uh, your first modifications uh, or third-party add-ons for, so for the Jeep the or the YJs? I actually, uh, a lot of things I never even advertised. Um, I was actually working with uh, Thule, uh, T-H-U-L-E, which uh, they're in the rack business. Their competitor is uh, Yakima. And we were actually uh, working together on a rack system for Jeeps. And uh, that kind of fizzled. Uh, for no other reason than dealing with the corporate world. Um, I did do a lot of store displays and things of that nature for that corporation. But then eventually the Cherokee came around. My first Cherokee was uh, bought from my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, and uh, that immediately got lifted, so on and so forth. And it, I pulled up in their driveway one day, and uh, they're like, this is my Jeep? <laughs> <laughs> it makes a huge difference in the way it looks, doesn't it? It sure does. I mean, one sure looks like does. a grocery getter; the other one looks like a uh, gosh, I don't know. It's they, they look they just look amazing whenever they're lifted with large tires. Uh, that wasn't right. the one you had in mothballs, was it? No, the first one was a silver one. And you can see it in a number of pictures with the uh, got a round tube sectional bumper on the front, kind of uh, Jeep Speed kind of looking. Mm-hmm. And uh, that one dates back the furthest, and then there was numerous in between that one and the mothball one. So most of those got ended up getting cut up or resold or chopped and sold or things of that nature. So uh, apparently you prefer the XJs over the, the YJs or the TJs, and uh, I don't believe you're, you're too... Um, thrilled on the the sheet metal uh, that's being used on the JKs. So, JKs are going to be the next CJ5, if you ask me, or CJ7, however you want to look at it. Um, yeah, I think they're going to be pretty prone to rotting myself, but that's just my opinion. Right. <clears throat> um, yeah, the XJ is very versatile. The extra wheelbase um, is extremely beneficial. Um over a, uh, over a TJ. I, I like TJs. I think TJs were uh, the best Wrangler-style Jeep ever made myself. Um, but, yeah, the Cherokee's very versatile. I've camped in mine. I've done trails. I've done hill climbs. I've done things that other Jeeps struggled or couldn't do, and they paid a heck of a lot more money for them than I did. Yeah, that's so. that's the thing that really amazed me and my dumb luck in picking one because, as I've told the story numerous time numerous times, that's what the wife went and I went to go buy was a TJ a nineteen ninety eight yeah. TJ. And, TJs are fun. Yep, we'll get one too, and uh, that, yeah. that'll be hers. No, uh, I'll probably end up with another one myself, or even a YJ and do a coil conversion, but. Yeah, then they're just fun. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, take the top off and put it back on and take it off and put it back on. I mean, you can take the top off an XJ, but it's generally not something you take off and put back on. Not unless the you have fabrication snares. The other thing that pointed me towards the Cherokees was I had a Greyhound for a number of years, and she was a large Greyhound, an X, X racetrack dog, and uh, she never could fit into a YJ, a TJ, or... Any of those type of vehicles. Wow, she really must have been big. And actually, our daily drivers at the time were bought around the dog. Um, conversion vans and things of that nature. So, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, Owen uh, getting involved in uh, the uh, the business, so to speak. Um, this may be a little indirectly helping Dad out. Uh, I think your uh, your wife gets involved in, uh, in the business as well, doesn't she? Erica. Erica's a big help at times. Um, <laughs> she used to be, <laughs> well, times. ever since Owen, it kind of consumes time, you know? Gotcha. Okay. So, I thought that was a dig uh, at I mean, the wife. She used to be, <clears throat> you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe what that girl used to do. But, um, yeah, she does all the paperwork and the processing and things of that nature. And, uh, she's, uh, now that Owen's in school, I think she's going to be coming out to the shop and 
doing some cutting for me and things of that nature, you know, the repetitious work. Wow, that'll be great. Um, I'm sure doing the paperwork and stuff is a, a huge uh, benefit. It lets you concentrate on the, the things that have to be made in the shop. Yeah, the paperwork is, uh, it can be cumbersome. I'm not a real good at the, uh, I'm not a paperwork guy, put it that way. Very tedious. Yeah. Lots of detail. So uh, I know that you have the, uh, and you mentioned some of the stuff that you were making for the the YJs and, of course, uh, the products that you make for the XJs, uh, I'm well aware of, and I'm, I'm sure our audience is too. Uh, are there, do you make uh, products for other things that you don't have on the site, or is it, uh, do you do custom work for other vehicles? Uh, I think I remember seeing some stuff, uh, uh, Chevrolet truck or uh, something in, in one of the customs you've done. Do people come to you for all sorts of things, or are you pretty much focusing just on Jeep stuff? They do, not as much as they used to. Um, walk-in traffic in this kind of environment is almost counterproductive. Um, when, you, when, you're doing, when, you're, when you're promoting a product line and you're trying to manufacture parts, um, basically the business comes from the net or over the phone. Now, when you get walk-in traffic, you know, everybody wants to shoot the, shoot the bull. Of and, course. Uh, you know, can you do this? Can you do that? And then, you know, you spend time with them, you throw them a number, and, you know, they can turn around and walk away. Then it's just the way it is. It's the nature of the beast. Um, they don't all walk away, don't get me wrong, but you, you've pretty much consumed that hour and a half that you could have applied to fabricating to your existing clients, or you can apply it to shooting the breeze with somebody who might want something. Right. Um, as far as other vehicles, uh, yeah, but it's all done on a custom basis. Gotcha. So there's no other products that you have really other than what you see on the site? Um, no, there is not. Um, but honestly, eventually, someday... Um, I really wouldn't mind doing custom furniture. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's it's just something to let the mind wander a little more than working in the jigs. Well, I'm remembering back whenever you were telling me how uh, somebody was, uh, some of your friends up in um, uh, Connecticut, uh, competitors or friends or whatever, was, was saying that you don't make bumpers, you make furniture that goes on vehicles because it's yeah, so I've, well done. I've heard that. I can't tell you where I heard that, but yes, I, that's true. I've heard that. So when you said about <laughs> making furniture, that I remembered you telling me about that, and I thought that was pretty funny. Um, I had one guy who put a bumper. He said he put his bumper in his living room under his coffee table because he just wanted to look at it. He had a glass-top <laughs> coffee table. <laughs> I'm like, okay. You know, some of that stuff, I mean, I don't know how the wife would handle that stuff, but some of that stuff is, is very pretty. And if I made it myself, I think I may have to do the same thing, at least for a little while. Well, you're either going to maintain or increase the value of a vehicle, or you're going to go the other way. And if I'm going to be in business, I'm not going to put people the other way. Sure. So, you know, you have to put out your best effort. So, uh, I know that you've spent uh, a little time working on the tailbone um, for the the XJ, and I remember seeing some stuff on NAXJ, a picture of a, a test unit, and it seems like it was a year or longer before you actually came out with, with the tailbone. Do you two years. Wow. And so, it's been uh, two years since. Well, it was January 2009 we introduced the tailbone. And uh, the initial prototypes are actually still on the trail today, and they're not half as, as stout as what we're producing now. It was a, it was a wonderful idea, and it it really is great from the standpoint of shipping because you know I know personally how much it costs to to pay to have a full bumper shipped uh, the first one right. from Connecticut then the the second one from Kentucky right and uh, although it wasn't that expensive it was it it does I think it was like ten percent the cost of the of the bumper and you know that's substantial. Frankly, I was surprised that you know they they ship things that big and that heavy, but um, you know you do and you learn. So yeah, it's it's a more secure package to ship. Um, every time I uh, ship a full bumper, it's uh, I, I had some bad experiences with uh, one of the carriers in the past, and 
it, it ended up costing me a lot of money. Well, I know you spend uh, a lot of time wrapping those things and packing them. Because yeah. I spent a good 15, 20 minutes unwrapping it. It's fun, isn't it, though? <laughs> it's like I, I just wanted Come to on, see man. the damn thing. <laughs> you just sit there and you sing happy birthday to me. So, anyway, where I was going with this was uh, you spent two years uh, getting the, the tailbone uh, into production, so to speak. What was, how much, is that your longest duration for a product? And how much design and build and testing do you do on these things normally? Um, anything that's going to hang off a vehicle, I'd like to see a year on, um, on actually daily use and trail use. Um, the backbone, that, that is the front winch mount and recovery. That was pretty stout right from the start. And, uh, I think we put like six months into that one. But any of the rear items that involve a tire carrier or that can fall into traffic, um, I like to see them used for a year. Well, that makes sense. Um, and, of course, there is the responsibility of the owner to maintain it and, you know, make it part of their normal maintenance to look it over and check things out, you know. It's, while it's going to last longer than the Cherokee, it, it's, uh, you know, it is prone to uh, vibration and being hit and so on and so forth. Well, I know that uh, my... Uh my slimline bumper is is very stout, and that tire carrier that I, I got with it has never moved from day one. Well, my wife didn't latch it back one time, and it moved. But I remember that when it was <laughs> when it was latched properly, it, it it's mm-hmm. rock solid. I mean, uh, and I haven't done a lot of off roading, but what I've done, it didn't move. It's yeah, man, it is solid as a rock. And I'd love to do a secondary latch, but honestly. I think a lot of people, probably 85% of the crowd, would forget about the secondary latch and, uh, you know, because it's just more cumbersome. It's human nature to do the shortcut sometimes, you know. Right. So so, so was this your longest design and build, uh, or is that uh, typical for, for your type of... No, uh, it's absolutely the very longest. Um the whole thought process, I probably had two months of thinking about it before I even <laughs> started to pick up a piece of steel. But, uh, no, it's, 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 uh, it's something. It, it really is something. But uh, it's a lot of tolerance involved as far as assembling all the parts. A lot of work with a number of different vendors. I think, uh, well, now I'm up to six vendors on that item, six separate vendors to make that happen. The tailbone. It's a it's a real nice product, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again. If I was going to build another uh, XJ, I would go with the, the backbone and the tailbone. Uh, there's something to be said for uh, an XJ that has a, a stock look to it, but you still have the recovery points, and you still have the ability to carry a spare tire and have a winch on the front. Right. You know, there's there's definitely a crowd out there that appreciates the the factory appearance, and and I actually do pair them up quite often and sell them uh, to an individual at the same time, front and rear. And of course, we give them a little break on that, but um, we're just happy that you know they, they think that much of the product. Yeah, well, uh, the quality, I've, I've just been blown away by the quality. And whenever I find a, um, find a vendor that gives me a good product <clears throat> and also to great customer service, um, I try to promote them with people that I talk to and of course, I have the benefit of of having a um, um, surprisingly popular, in my mind, uh, website, and I'm more than happy to uh, promote uh, those vendors on my site uh, as I do your stuff. And I always tell people um, where I got the bumper and uh, who to talk to, and so on and so forth. So, well, it's appreciated on our end, and I remember that day. I think I was building your front bumper when you said uh, you think you were going to start a. It's a forum. Right. And actually, I was going to... I think I said, huh? Yeah. <laughs> a, a Jeep forum? Are you sure? <laughs> are you sure, <laughs> Do you actually know how many Jeep forums there are out there already? <laughs> but there's no talking to you, so... No, no. I, I do what I think's best. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's the way um, most successful or sometimes most losers uh, 
<laughs> wind up. They they do what they think's best. So hey, you took on the challenge and you're doing good with it. So hats off to you. Thank you. And that's actually the other thing I was going to bring up is uh, you've actually been a XJ Talk member since uh, almost day one. I think that um, you know, like you said, we were talking and I told you about it, and it was uh, yeah, okay. I'll come over there and see what you got. But uh, actually, actually, I used your I used your family forum, if you remember, to uh, do the in, to uh, lay out the install instructions for the tailbone. Oh, that's right. And we we took them from your family forum, and uh, we started putting them on different websites. That's right. I had forgotten all about that. See, so you you're you're a helper in the community. <laughs> well, it's good to not be a taker for for all my life. <laughs> But uh, just wanted to, to say I appreciate uh, the uh, um, eventual words of encouragement on the site. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at least, uh, at least you didn't say, "Oh, this is a bunch of crap," and I'm not going to be anywhere associated with this. Maybe you just wanted to see the train wreck. I don't know. But uh, it's, nah, it's been... I just come over, and have a little fun, and try to liven up the place now and then. Yeah, well, that that certainly is the case. Uh, I think that uh, the the thread that you started, uh, random picture thread. Uh, may not have been an original idea, but it certainly has been the most popular one uh, on the site. I think we have uh, certainly in the maybe 20,000 views of that, literally, yeah, yeah, literally 27,000 yeah. views on that, that one uh, that one thread or that one forum. It wasn't original, but uh, I did that on another forum that was uh, trying to come around at one point, and... Uh, it actually helped pick things up um, once people caught on to what was going on. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, every now and then, other than the funny stuff, I'll try to sneak in a little product now and then. Sure. So, you know, what the heck? So, uh, do you have anything that you might want to tell us about that you're coming out with the for the XJ? Um, anything you maybe you're just thinking about? Well, there's a lot of things being thought about, <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, I've had a recent customer, um, again, a custom rear bumper, um, who came back, shoot, I don't even think it was a matter of days after he, uh, I don't even think the bumper was finished yet, and uh, somebody was producing a pillar, which is your very front pillar that retains your windshield, uh, light brackets, Mm -hmm. but they had gone out of production, and no vendors were making them, and... uh, I kind of shrugged it off at first and uh, started looking around on the forums and it seems like a lot of people were wanting them, but nobody could get them. A few guys out there were trying to make them, but quite frankly, they weren't really up to snuff. And uh, so I kind of got involved in that, and that's very, very recent. Um, Actually, uh, I've got pictures back from the install uh, this morning from the individual. I sent them off to him for a Christmas present and because uh, it was his idea. And uh, So I guess A-pillar lighting brackets, similar to the TJ look, um, are definitely in the works uh, probably by the end of the month. I think that'll and be a I big did, winner. I did uh, sneak a picture on the uh, random picture thread today. Yeah, I did see that. I was wondering, because uh, you've done that before uh, with a tire carrier that you were actually working on, a one that clips on the back of the uh, the the door of the XJ. We can talk about that, and that'll relate right back to testing and why we do it for, or I like to do it for a year. Right. So um, I, I know that you occasionally come out with, I mean, you'll, you'll post like little teasers, and you won't say, this is what I'm working on, this is what I'm thinking about. It's just like, here, you know, well, here you go. <laughs> I'm just looking for a public reaction at yeah. that point. And and always the public reaction is, oh, my God, where did I get that? Where did you get that? How, <laughs> how do I get that? So it's uh, it's actually, uh, and I'm sure you built yourself quite a market with the tailbone, uh, uh, letting it uh, hover out there uh, with these uh, with one or two random pictures and people wanting to know where the hell is this thing for two years. Um, yeah, I was asked for two years pretty solid. In, in all fairness, we did take uh, with the move, and the house sale and all that and the shop, um, we did take about four months, five months off. Because, you know, you have to prep for the move, and then you have to do the actual move, and then... Oh, well, moving's horrible. Move in, and then you're so tired from that that you take a week or three off. Mm-hmm. 
And then you sit around and uh, you say, oh, I got to get a shop going again. <laughs> so Exactly. So we did have a, a small break in there. That uh, was actually a good size break, I'd say. But right. uh, yeah, we uh, I focused heavily once uh, things were back up and running and uh, got that going. And it's actually been refined since uh, its first introduction. And I think it's about as good as it can be at this point. Now, the flames that are on on the tailbone, they've been there in there since the beginning, right? Flames are on there from the beginning. <laughs> uh, people could always do the delete option on them. And it got to the point where I was getting so many deletes that I'm not doing flames any longer. Ah, okay. I didn't know that. So, I mean, I haven't altered anything on the website. but And I can add flames if need be. But uh, really, nobody seems to be missing them. And in my original twisted thinking of the design, it needed something to do something in that area, mm -hmm. you know. But um, well, maybe, visually, it looks looks great. Maybe that's I'm looking the, at a, looking at a set from here hanging on the wall. Maybe so. that's that old muscle car uh, style that you used to do. Oh, absolutely! And who doesn't like flames? I mean, one out of twenty-five people. Right. So I thought it was a win-win, and a lot of guys did want them. But, well, uh, well, I'm sure it's a lot easier not to have the flames on it, a lot easier to make. Um, Straight cut? Really, that was all laser cut, so my hands weren't in that portion of it. Um, that was one of my vendors. Gotcha. They, they'd be responsible for uh, you know the programming and stuff. So uh, really what it does is it offers a, a much less sharper edge for rust to create or uh, chipping, you know, and things of that nature. So I don't really miss them, miss the flames that much. Uh, you were talking about the A-pillar uh, light mounts, and uh, mm -hmm. th that's something that I had been interested in a while back. But with my current mindset with the four lights, uh, four six-inch KCs I have on the, the front bumper, and, mm -hmm. I, and I'm thinking of some overhead lights, I just think the A-pillar lights would be, just an amazing overkill of lights. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm a big flashlight fan from, from when I was a little kid, and I think that's also uh, morphed into the off-road thing because I just love lights, lights and watches. So uh, I probably can't do that, but I was thinking, I don't know if you saw the the uh, the post that I put on there to yours whenever I saw the A-pillar lights. Yeah, because, you got to submit that drawing, and I'll take a look at it. Because I was kind of <laughs> kind of thinking, I was kind of thinking that you know this would actually be perfect for what I was wanting, which was overhead lights, but kind of like mm -hmm. the overhead lights that are on for the TJs and you know the Wrangler crowd, right. um, where it's not on the <clears throat> the the roof rack mount. It's it's a, a bar and has a loop that goes around the lights. And I thought you know a pair of those A pillar mounts with either a bolt hole or a, uh, you know, where the tube could, you know, mount onto those would be, might be perfect. Yeah, actually, I was right. thinking about doing a drawing and, and, and shooting it over there to you <laughs> and letting you pick it apart like you did my drawing on the front bumper. I actually, I mean, it doesn't relate to XJs, but um, one of my original products that I was geared up to do but never advertised or, I don't know, I never got my feet wet with it was an actual uh, cowl cowl light bar for uh, YJs and TJs that would go in, down and it's not the same style that's being advertised in some of the catalogs now but the lights would be in front of the driver and I actually had uh, exterior gauges on the bar as well visually it was a perfect shot right in front of your eyes mm -hmm. but uh, I never really pursued that so you're looking at the A-pillar mounts. Anything else that's on the horizon that you care to share or just too far down the uh, the thought process right now? Uh, FSCs, which stands for Front Shock Cheaters, we just got on the website uh, two nights ago. And uh, you can use those for much like the STMs for the rear, but if, if you keep increasing your lift and you don't want to go out and buy new shocks all the time, you can use that item to cheat your shock, and you can also use it to tune your shock. And by tuning, what I mean is if, if your wheel is stuffed into the wheel well and, and you look at your shock and there's still two, two and a half inches of shock shaft exposed, you can use that going in the other direction. 
So it's kind of a wasted shock with that much shaft sticking up out of it. So if you were to tune your shock to where your wheel is stuffed or up against your bump stop and take that dimension and let it work downward for you, I think you're ahead of the ball game by doing that. And that's where the front shock cheaters or the S or the FSCs, I should say, um, can play a role for you. I am kind of rethinking the design a little bit. I know the design works, but I think I can do it as a bar pin eliminator as well. So I'm going to look into that as an alternative. Oh, I see what you mean, putting it up top instead of on the bottom. No, it'll still be in the bottom, but you won't have the bar pin going through the shock. you use a 5-8 Oh, bolt. okay, okay. I didn't understand so, what the bar pin was. Yeah. So I am, I'm thinking of that as an alternative um, to the current design because there's machining involved with the current design, which is a little bit time-consuming, but I think I can get the price down further if I do it bar pin eliminator style. So, I don't, so as time permits, I'll be getting into that. Right. Um, way, way back, I posted or snuck a picture in or two of the uh, reinforcement for the front of the rear spring packs. This would apply to the front portion of your, your uh, leaf spring on the XJ, which if you study it long enough, it's not hard to figure out how weak that area can be. Um, that's a product that's ready to go. It's just a matter of developing the web page for it. Um, basically, it involves a bridge of sorts that acts as a gusset and uh, another filler piece, which can also be used to restore that area because it's prone to rotting out on Cherokees. So the the snow belt crowd could uh, use it for uh, uh Re, uh, you know, rebuilding that area at the same time. So it's kind of a multifunctional piece. And it's the only downside of it, if there is a downside, it's absolute welding. So that's going to limit its marketability. True. There's no getting around uh, the welding. Okay, Mark, one of the things I like to do is uh, ask people uh, what they love or what they hate about xjtalk.com. Uh, XJ Talk, I don't hate anything about it, per se. Um, got a couple of features um, I really don't use that often. I'm not prone to using them in the chat, but it's fun once in a while. I do jump in there every so often. Um, just a good group of guys, really. No, uh, no picking on each other. Um, straightforward answers when we can. Um, it's fun. Got a good mix there. Guys from all over the world, actually. Um, it's just a good place to be. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, you're doing a good job, Tony. I'm, I'm leaving it alone, mainly. I'm staying out of it. <laughs> <laughs> you might be better off. <laughs> I, I try to keep my hands out of it, just try to put some features in and, and uh, you know, not tell people what to do. And, you know, unfortunately, me staying away from it has, has been a success. So, Mark, I want to thank you very much for the interview, and uh, it was very interesting. I learned a few things that uh, I didn't know about you from our conversations uh, on the phone over the years, uh, from the various projects that uh, uh, that you've done for me, and um, just uh, very interesting and a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Hey, it was my pleasure. I enjoyed it very much, Tony. My favorite site is xjtalk.com. XJ Talk, XJ Talk, it's where you go when you're not off-road.